time now to apply insights from all of our earlier panels to investments in growing Asian markets, we would like to segue to our fireside chat. Mr. Erwan Barr, who leads RHT Loss Technology Industry Group and co-leads its corporate and capital markets practice, will be moderating the chat. And also, he will be delivering the closing remarks. Also, to maximize your virtual conference experience, we will have another Tea Time networking session in our virtual networking lounge. Now, back to our final session. Chatting with Er1 on the investment climate in their respective markets and jurisdictions are partners from the RHT Law led ASEAN Plus Group. From Vietnam, we have Mr. Benjamin Yap partner at RHT Law Vietnam. From the Philippines, we have Mr. Richard Hendrick Beltran, partner at Villaraza and Ananco. And finally, from India, we have Mr. Anant Merathia, managing partner of Anant Merathia and Associates. Over to you, Erwan. Good afternoon. Uh, we've heard very interesting presentations so far, all of them about Southeast Asia in general. And with this fireside chat, what we would like to do is to dive into three key markets for tech investments in the region, India, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And to discuss this, as Laurie just said, we have invited three distinguished guests to share their views on this market. So Anand, Ben, and Richard, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I have prepared a few questions for this session around two themes. The first one is, what are the current trends in investments in your respective countries? And the second one is, what are the legal and regulatory pitfalls to be mindful of to make successful investments in India, the Philippines, and Vietnam? And of course, we will take questions from the audience as they, as they come in. So, Anand, let, let's start with India. What is the current trend for investments in India, and, and what has been the impact of COVID? Uh, hi, Arvind. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as far as India is concerned, uh, the momentum for investments has actually started about a decade ago. And the last five years, it has been fairly strong and uh, inviting a great amount of investment into the country. COVID did have an impact. Uh, then there has been good enough resilience and recovery. Uh, with respect to tech investments, uh, I, I do have some uh, data with me, which I would be uh, sharing as another reading with you. Uh, overall, tech investments from the VC side has grown to three times, uh, from the tune of about $15 billion in 2020. 45 billion dollars. So these are in the middle of two pandemic years. Uh, and the FDA inflow uh, in the non conventional energy sector has been significant. In the last about two decades, it's crossed $10 billion. Uh, also, there has been a fair bit of investment in the renewable energy sector space and the technology around it, the tune of about $42 billion since 2014. And, and India is focusing a fair bit on that. Uh, the government of India wants to develop a green city concept where it's more on sustainable energy, renewable energy, a lot of cities. Two major Indian corporates, uh, the Reliance Group uh, and, and, and the Adani Group, they've uh, committed a return of about $10 billion. Uh, Reliance has committed $10 billion with respect to a green energy complex, whereas uh, the Adani Group has committed for improving or having more solar plants to the tune of about $20 billion. Uh, US dollar for the next decade. So the theme in India has been on the tech side, both on uh, fintech as well as the recent times picking up more on the tech side. So, thanks. Um, and, and who are the main investors in uh, in uh, in India? And would it be mostly Indian VCs or foreign VCs or strategic investors? It's a combination. Uh, oh, when it is. Uh, from India, there, there are people, there are funds from India, such as the Zoom Ventures, which manages about three funds to the tune of about $150 million. And they also do investments with green side. There's elevation capital from India, uh, three for one. Uh, US has obviously been a forefront uh, investor in India, Sequoia Capital, Axel India, Alpha Wave. Uh, and there are others from like Canada, Netherlands, uh, companies such as Naspers, uh, and, and a fund called the Fairfax Financial. Uh, the major initial investments in India have been more so with payment-related uh, apps and uh, services, such as the Paytm, which was the highest investment to the tune of about $1.7 billion. They came up with an IPO also recently, of course, that had its own challenges. Then there are other uh, companies, such as the Bharat Pay, 
which saw an investment of about 370 million dollars. Uh, Pine Labs, uh, USD 600 million dollars. Uh, there was a huge investment in PayU, which is about 4.7 billion dollars as well. Uh, again, these are on the fintech side and on the green side, uh, uh, Indian uh, conglomerate, uh, the Tata Group, has something called the Tata Clean Tech, which manages a fund to the tune of about uh, USD $650 million, and it's, it's doing a fair bit of work on the sustainable energy segment. Uh, there's Nexus Ventures. These are all Indian funds, Nexus Ventures Partners, uh, which is again uh, managing five funds to the tune of about $1.5 billion. Then the first uh, investment fund in India on the green climate side, which was the Global Environment Fund, which was established somewhere in 1990. Uh, that's been there. So yeah, so again, a fair bit of these uh, funds have been active in India in the last uh, decade or so. Thanks. Okay, so, so it's really a mix of uh, domestic VCs, foreign VCs, and strategic. Okay, yes, and, yes. Um, we, we heard a lot in the prior presentations about NFTs, FinTech, and gaming. What are the main investment themes in, in India these days? So as far as NFTs is concerned, uh, it has been introduced in India recently, but it is not yet picked up pace. Uh, it, it, it hasn't seen pace of popularity either. Primarily the reason being uh, the demand is much lesser than the supply, and India is still at the conventional approach of owning a physical property or rather yet to accept the concept of digital property per se. That's for NFTs, but yeah. We'll have to wait and see how that goes. But the gaming industry uh, is definitely one of the fastest growing uh, markets uh, across the world. Uh, India has a fairly large young population with a user base of about 300, uh, 300 million users. And uh, there was a good uh, revenue generation to the tune of about $1.5 billion in the financial year 2019-20, which was 40% higher from the previous year, which shows that there has been a significant jump even in the middle of I mean, say challenge. Or rather, gaming has gone up during COVID times. Uh, contributory factors being uh, the young demography in India, uh, increasing the affordable internet, smartphones, and gaming technology. Uh, on the fintech side, which is which is of course the most important one, uh, the most promising and uh, rising sectors in the country has definitely been fintech, the growth of about 200 percent uh, in 2021 compared to the previous financial year. Uh, there has been a record. Uh, revenue generation of about $9 billion compared to uh, about $3 billion against the previous year. So we're seeing significant growth on, on the fintech side. Uh, the major avenues of investment continue to payment services, neobanks, uh, lending forums, insurances, and stock broking. So yeah, these, these are primarily the uh, areas of interest as far as fintech is concerned. Thanks. On, on one area that we didn't touch too much on, well, a little bit, but it's it's the gaming industry. I understand that there has been new regulation regarding the gaming industry with some foreign players not being able to stay in the country. Can, can you update us on that and tell us what you what you think the market regarding this? Right. So as far as the gaming industry in India is concerned, uh, there are no specific regulations regarding gaming, like video games, or esports, or so on and so forth. A uh, gaming and gambling industry in India are kind of more or less dealt uh, in a similar uh, manner with respect to the laws and regulations in the country. Uh, of course, there's, there's a state and subject, it's a subject matter of states, and it's not a uh, unified legislation, but it depends on the state to the equivalent of provinces in different parts of the country. The major law in India which regulates these issues is the Information Technology Act, which is a, which is a fair, fairly uh, old act in the year 2000 and various allied regulations. So that has been updated from time to time. And there have been issues uh, regarding digital concerns, licensing, piracy, and, and, and all of these have been from time to time incorporated into the Information Technology Act. But uh, there, at the moment, is, there is a specific law with respect to uh, the gaming industry. Re regarding tech companies, if you are a foreign investor, let's say you want to invest into India, well, obviously India is a big country, as we all know. Uh, what, what are the specific infra infrastructure, the, 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 the areas where you can go to to find tech companies? What, what is being put in place in India for for uh, technology companies in terms of infrastructure? So over there, quite a few. Uh, Bangalore, to begin with, is actually you know as, as sometimes referred to as the Silicon Valley of India has been identified by various VCs for the tech investments and startups. Uh, it continues to attract a fair bit of investment to tune off about almost 18 point or 19 or billion dollars to rank as the fifth of the world's top global cities for tech investments, which was about a couple of years back. Uh, 
Uh, apart from Bangalore, you have uh, cities such as uh, Gurgaon, which is near Delhi, Pune. Uh, these these are cities which which have having a strong ecosystem for for tech companies. Also, India is now strongly working and propagating on the model of something called the smart city. Uh, and the Indian government is pushing this uh, fairly strong, and the idea of these is to build a strong collaboration with states on a on a public-private partnership model, and to develop economic corridors, uh, which will attract private investments and give them significant amount of advantages, benefits, tax rebates, tax incentives, so on and so forth. Uh, revitalizing the manufacturing activities, and of course, there's a huge again renewable energy and green push in these smart cities. Uh, they will have uh, sustainable development models, and also, for example, like the, a simple thing such as the internet connectivity, so on and so forth, will be extremely seamless and and strong. One major such um, smart city in India that has already been, if I may say, implemented to a reasonable extent and has significant work. Going in there is called the Gujarat International Financial Tech City. It's called the Gift City, which is uh, in the range of about uh, three or three hundred sixty hectares. It's a it's a multi-service uh, special economic zones, as they call it in India, and it's a first of its kind. Uh, it it has investments uh, to the tune of about one point four four billion dollars that have been committed from one forty companies, and this is actually something which is picked up momentum and and is being being implemented. So, Gift City is definitely a, a major uh, investment infrastructure already, which offers office spaces, residential apartments, schools, hotels, clubs, so on and so forth. Uh, it's attracting companies from the IT and ITS segment, finance companies, international banks, uh, global trading insurance companies, offshore banks, data centers, uh, and, and there are plans to have, depending on the learnings from the Gift City model, the idea is to replicate this model with other Places and and Gujarat is on the western side of India, above Bombay or Mumbai for those who build uh, the nice capital of India. So that's that's one great model that's that's coming up western side. Of India. Thanks. I, I like the idea of a gift city. Um, to, talking about infrastructure, um, what, what about the cloud market in in India? I heard that it's developing faster than in the rest of the region. What, what is the status and the state of development? So. Uh, the, the cloud market in India has has developed uh, fairly fast thanks to uh, I mean pandemic has taught us various things good and bad of course most of them not being so good but then the tech side of it has significantly taken a uh, upswing there so during these last two years work from home as as in many countries became a major uh, culture in India and the impact of this was seen as a key driver uh, towards the cloud adoption in the years 2020 and 2021. Uh, various companies have been bullish on the investments in cloud infrastructure, cloud platforms, uh, softwares to to make the uh, operations stronger, resilient, and and cloud definitely continues to be a if I may say a foundational pillar for innovation, collaboration, and uh, digital transformation, which is which is witnessing an accelerated adoption by a lot of uh, companies in India. And these are not just big companies, but also SMEs and mid-sized companies. Uh, because that's the need of the art. It's not something which people have done out of choice, but out of the situation. Uh, in 2021 alone, India added about 42 unicorns, uh, valued at about $82 billion US dollars. Uh, the International Data Corporation uh, predicts that there will be an overall Indian public cloud services market, uh, which will reach somewhere to the tune of about $11 billion by 2025. Also, there has been a, a study done by the Deloitte. Uh, which shows that the growth of the cloud and co-location market in India is likely to grow at a rate uh, at, at an accelerated growth rate of about 30 percent to reach the same 10 to 11 billion dollars by 2023. So we're definitely looking at a, a strong and, and and good development on on the cloud uh, market. It's, it's developing pretty fast and pretty well in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now have the questions down the road on India because it's a, it's a very interesting landscape and, and area. Uh, but we, we also want to speak about the, the Philippines and Vietnam, obviously. Uh, th thank you for, for these answers. Turning to the Philippines, Richard. Uh, thank you. I, thank I, you. I, I would like to have a better understanding as to you know where the market is in terms of, of tech investments. And 
I understand that the Philippines, you know, like many countries in the region, try to facilitate such investments. And I, I do understand, I realize that you're not a tax expert, but there has been a, a create flow that I've heard about. Can you tell us a bit more about it, you know, what, what it means for uh, investors into the technology industry? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that question, Erwan. So um, the Philippines just recently passed a CREATE law. The CREATE law um, actually provides incentives for various industries within the Philippines. Um, among others, what the CREATE law provided is there is a reduction in terms of the income tax rates um, and the taxation rates for corporations doing business in the Philippines. Specifically, Erwan, um, the CREATE law has this, what they call the tier three investments. And for tier three investments, among those, um, among the activities which are covered by, tech, by tier three investments are those investments which relate to you know, innovative technologies. So when we say innovative technologies, this would include uh, activities or investments in um, new industries, uh, those which are providing um, advanced digital productions um, and new technologies. So this would include investments in, um, let's say, blockchain, AI, and these are the new uh, tech, new developments in terms of um, technology and innovation which are being incentivized by the Philippine government, which is um, it's being incentivized through the various incentives that are being granted to these industries under the CREATE law. So what are those incentives? So there, there is income tax holiday. There is also a special corporate income tax for these uh, tier three investments. And there are also enhanced deductions. So basically, given these incentives, um, what the Philippine government aims to provide is to ensure that um, there will be uh, companies who would want to enter the Philippines and invest in these kind of, in, in this kinds of technologies. So basically, uh, that's the overview as to how the CREATE law, which was recently passed, incentivizes the technology sector and investment in technology development. And, and what is the current trend for investment? You know, aside from CREATE law, which obviously is very new, but what, what is the trend for investment in technology in the Philippines right now? And you know, has it been impacted somehow by COVID? Yes. Um, actually, in terms of... Um, uh, Trends in technology, um, the latest trend on the past few years, especially during the pandemic, is, is focused on financial technology. We've seen a rise of companies who are entering in the Philippines. They are investing in um, payment systems because there was this recent law which was passed by the Philippine government, which is the National Payment Systems Act. It was passed 2018. So, um, it, um, there were lots of new players who um, entered in the Philippine market, and they are uh, they are they are investing and funding those which are engaged in fintech. So what the, what do these include? These include um, those who are into the payment systems, also credit card issuers and acquirers. So we have, we've had um, companies who are entering here also into digital banking and lend, lending companies. So um, those are the recent um, and quite popular trends in terms of investments in um, fintech. So there was actually a rise during the pandemic um, because primarily before um, in the Philippines, most of the, most of the population are using cash they want uh, they, they they are using the print money, but given the pandemic we're in, um, we could not um, really go out in our households during lockdowns. Uh, people were incentivized or they were triggered to download these platforms, the online banking platforms. So we saw that uh, there was an increase in terms of usage um, of um, payment platforms such as. There are, there's this company which we, is called Gcash. So they had uh, a, a, a huge leap in terms of n number of users during the, during the pandemic. There were also a rise in terms of banks having their own online banking platforms. So these are uh, what we see are the common trends in terms of um, investments in technology and in terms of COVID affecting it. Actually, what we what we can see is that it actually even facilitated the growth of this um, 
platforms, applications, and the usage of this um, mo mobile uh, applications that you can use for like day-to-day -day, um, ordering of um, ordering of let's say goods or logist uh, using logistics and also in terms of um, payments. So um, these are what we see were actually facilitated or were accelerated during the pandemic. You know, technology companies and startups, depending on what level of development they are. I understand from a survey which was sponsored by, by the government, uh, I think it was late last year, that 70% of founders found fundraising to be a major obstacle to development. So, who, who are the main investors in Philippine technology companies these days? Uh, you know, again, domestic VCs, foreign VCs, strategy, who, who is coming to invest? Yes, well, in terms of those who are funding um, financial technology companies such as payment platforms, lending companies. We've seen that um, most of those who are, who are funding this are foreign companies. So they are establishing either a local entity here in the Philippines. They are incorporating their own um, domestic corporation or they um, establish a branch office in the Philippines, which most of the time is fully foreign owned. So what we can say in terms of who are the major investors, it's still um, companies who are based abroad, startup companies who are based abroad. So they create either their, um, their branch here in the Philippines or they set up their own local company here in the Philippines. Uh, I read also a survey which is conducted by a, an audit company and based on that survey, um, those who are funding startup companies, most of those who fund are still families or those who are sourcing um, funds from their own pockets. So these are the founders of the startups. So, well, to answer your question, the those who are funding um, the technology investments in the Philippines are still mostly foreign companies, foreign startups, and um, those who are who have funds from their own families or from their own pockets. So it's mostly for the foreign investors, it's mostly strategic investors, uh, operating company as opposed to foreign VCs. Um, well, yes, uh, those who are really into the operations, not much of the VCs. Right, okay. Um, wh where do tech companies invest in the Philippines? That is, you know, uh, do you have dedicated infrastructure, dedicated uh, areas, zones for these companies? Where can we find them? Or are they just scattered across across the country? Well, uh, most of the companies establish their headquarters in the national region. So it's the Metro Manila. So usually they have um, they create a branch office or they set up a, a domestic corporation, uh, which principal place of business is in uh, the Metro Manila region. So um, so in terms of infrastructure. Uh, there is actually not, it's not, uh, we have here what we call Philippine Economic Zone Authority. And then there, if you will have your office in the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, there are also additional incentives that are, that, that, that the companies can avail by having their businesses located in this Philippine Economic Zones. So the Philippine economic zones, it's not limited in Metro Manila. There are also economic zones um, in nearby uh, regions in Metro Manila, such as Region 4, that's the Calabar zone. It's like uh, two hours away from Metro Manila. There's also one in north of the north of Luzon. Um, it's called the Cagayan Economic Zone Authority. So those businesses which are located in these economic zones, they are given additional incentives for being located in this particular uh, places. We, we talked earlier about FinTech, uh, and you mentioned that there was a lot of development in FinTech for, for the reasons you explained. Are there other you know, verticals or areas of technology which are pretty uh, developing pretty strongly in the Philippines? Or is it mostly FinTech? We, we talked earlier about you know, NFTs and, and metaverse and stuff, gaming, et cetera. You know, what are the areas? 
Yes, in terms of NFTs, I I think it's not yet as familiar in the Philippines as in other Southeast Asian countries, perhaps Singapore. So I've heard of some investments, but it's in terms of like reaching the the wide market or the mainstream market. I don't think it's still uh, uh it's still as big. In terms of um other investments apart from fintech, which I talked a while ago, we see also investments in gaming sector. So there are companies. Uh, technology companies which are providing gaming services such as Mineski. There are also um, technology companies which are providing entertainment um, such as Kumu. There are also um, companies, software companies, they brand themselves as software companies which are providing logistic services such as Lalamove, there is this Borzo and also Gab penetrated already the Philippine market. So um so in terms of technology the most of the investments are still in the in um software companies which provide various products such as transportation logistics food ordering um those are the trends here in the Philippines. Yes, and still talking about um you know infrastructure what what is the status of 5G development in the Philippines? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So in terms of 5G development um well in the philippines it's already on being rolled out but it's not yet uh, rolled out on a nationwide basis i think right now but i think the technology and telecommunications company are targeting to have uh infrastructures that will ensure that 5g connection will be uh, supported so but right now if you go to uh the capital region you will be able to use the 5g and, and the, the 5g yeah, 5G infrastructure is available. So when you use your phone, you can see that you can that your phone can detect 5G sites. So, but it's mainly uh, still um, concentrated within the national capital region. So, um, but eventually, hopefully, I'm not sure as to when they will roll it out. Uh, it it should um, reach the other regions in the Philippines apart from the national capital region. Very much, Richard. I, I don't have more questions at this point, but we'll look at the audience questions a bit later. Okay. Uh, I will. I will turn to, to Ben and talk about Vietnam. Uh, ben, you 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 seem to be living in a country which is very optimistic on the startup scene. Uh, I I would like to ask you what is driving this optimism? You know, particularly after 2020, 2021, which for most of the world has been a very pessimistic period. Well, how is Vietnam so eager to start and, and develop? Thanks, everyone. Well, you know, I think we 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 uh, we shouldn't forget that Vietnam is essentially a very young population. Um, you know, more than fifty percent of of the population is under thirty, thirty five. Uh, so it's a very young population. Uh, they also have a lot of time on their hands, um, uh, and, and a lot of them engage in, uh, in in gaming and and, and whatnot. So it is a population, and and you know by nature, uh, the Vietnam population because of the way the country has developed, you know, at, at at any point in time, it was always being occupied by some other force. Uh, they are always uh, survivors, uh, and they're known for their survival skills. And so, as 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 a population, they are very entre entrepreneurial as well. So while yes, Vietnam was affected by COVID, obviously, uh, and you can see just just the landscape of where I live and work. You know, you can see many uh, restaurants and companies that have closed down and start up. Uh, but to them, that is just part of life. And so, you know, uh, uh, I think what, what we see in Vietnam is they are really serial entrepreneurs. And so despite COVID, um, you know, uh, the people have survived and they've come out stronger, I guess. Uh, but, you know, what is driving... Uh, and, and so, you know, I guess it, it lends towards uh, a, a, a natural ecosystem um, for startups. Uh, and a lot of it is obviously driven locally. Um, but as 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 uh, as, as uh, you will see, uh, you know, it's also there's also government policy now, uh, which is trying to encourage more, uh, in terms of um, uh, to encourage more foreign investment into this area. The government recognizes that this is an area which they cannot lag behind, uh, and so uh, you know, areas like fintech, <coughs> and even even a very big area like NFTs, non fungible fungible token, where there isn't even a law for this. 
it's, it's something which the government realizes they have to look into, and, and, and they are starting already to look into this. Uh, but you know, areas of re revenue growth uh, would be in terms of fintech and e-commerce mainly. Uh, you know, there is obviously rising consumer spending with a a, a very large and young population, um, and you know you are increasingly seeing um, investments from strategic investors coming from uh, Japan, from Korea, from Singapore in terms of uh, uh, VCs as well as uh, institutional investors. Uh, and, and these are all uh, obviously together with, um, there, there isn't an overarching sort of government um, plan or government support targeted at startups um, or even fintech or e-commerce, uh, but you know, there is uh, uh, government support and we can see that generally the policy is to, to look into these areas uh, to help um, to help and support local investors uh, by encouraging more foreign investment. So that, that, that's interesting. So the, the two areas which are almost dynamic, if I understand correctly, is that fintech and e-commerce. That, mm. That's really the, the, the biggest, you know, elephants in the room, so to speak. Yes. And, and, and so you're having more and more foreign investment there. I, I heard, I'd heard of the, the GIC and SoftBank investment, I think it was last year, in CNP, which was a massive investment. Uh, but you see more more on those uh, to come, and where do they come from? Singapore, the U.S., Europe, China. Yeah, where, where I mean, do the investors come from? I mean, uh, Vietnam. Uh, the, the the government uh, always tries not to step what anybody told. Uh, as as a country, obviously, uh, with with its background um, and 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 proximity to China. Uh, obviously, there is, uh, and, and being both of uh, communist systems, there's a lot of support coming from China. Um, but there is also uh, a, a, a realization that they need to um, to be supportive of, um, of of every country that wants to come to Vietnam. I mean, it, it's, it's slowly becoming a, a manufacturing hub as well. Uh, with what's happening between the U.S. and China, you can see that uh, Vietnam has benefited from a lot of... Um, uh, companies uh, relocating their manufacturing, uh, if not completely, at least in terms of spreading their eggs, uh, the basket of eggs, across uh, the two countries. Um, I mean, take for example, and this is, this is a, it's Intel. Intel uh, uh, it has got a large investment in Vietnam, as, as does uh, Samsung. Uh, but when, when Intel decided to come to Vietnam, they, they had actually closed down um, if I'm not wrong, the Philippines branch as well as the Malaysian branch. Uh, problem was when they came to Vietnam, uh, the, the labor force or the skills of the labor force was not enough, so they had to reopen the Malaysian uh, and maybe even the Philippines branch again, uh, just to, to to be able to allow Vietnam time to catch up. And uh, what Viet Intel actually did was they created a university so that um, they, could, they could could help train the workforce, the local workforce, to support Intel and and, and Intel's investments in Vietnam. Uh, so this is just one one example. So obviously Intel is U.S. Uh, you mentioned SoftBank and GIC that was into um, a payment service called VNP. Uh, there are probably five or six um, e-commerce uh, fintech companies in Vietnam in this payment space, uh, payment intermediary space. Another one called uh, Momo. Uh, both uh, VNP, uh, uh, the parent company is VN Life. As well as Momo are probably the two or the largest um, investments uh, in Vietnam. Uh, VNP was about 250 million. Uh, interestingly, what GIC and SoftBank did was to invest a further 300 million. So it's a, it's a, a large space there. Uh, and Momo was about 200 million o over the last two years as well. Uh, so yes, a lot of interest and a lot of investors in this space. Uh, there's also, also a lot of interest now coming in from China in this space, e in this e-commerce space. Uh, including uh, uh, B2B lending as well. So, yeah, very interesting space. And so, I, I, I hear you about this. Uh, so, 100% foreign investment is allowed in technology, if I understand correctly. Uh, there is no limitation there. What does the government do, if anything, to help uh, foreign investment into technology companies? Do they have, can they rely on tax breaks? Do they have special economic zones? Do they have investment funds, you know, that, that will combine with foreign investors? What is the infrastructure, you know, if any, put in place by the government to, to assist? Yeah, they, they, again, 
there isn't anything overarching uh, where you can easily point to, uh, but there are various initiatives by the government. They have set up several funds. Most of this, especially if it's uh, technology and, and fintech related, is driven by uh, a government department called the Ministry of Science and Technology. Uh, and they uh, have been given purview of, uh, of funds, uh, about 11 to 15 billion US dollars, uh, to support um, uh, technology and, 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 and startups. Um, you know, and, and that includes um, loans, um, tax breaks, uh, and, and support. Uh, the government has also come up with um, an area called the Saigon Silicon um, City Center, where it's about 50 hectares of space uh, for uh, startup companies to, to, to be located in, uh, in Saigon. Um, and so, yeah, that, while there isn't anything which we could point to um, uh, to say that, you know, this is a real concerted effort, uh, they have, um, uh, and, and it's largely driven by technology, uh, where they want to encourage more R&D in Vietnam. Uh, and so this definitely there is. Uh, as you say, 100% foreign investment is already allowed. Um, there's still a lot uh, to be done in terms of transparency. Uh, you know, this is Vietnam. Um, it's, it's a common thing. Um, but uh, it's improved a lot, um, at least since I came to Vietnam 16 years ago. So, yes. Um, what area which usually uh, affects the data of tech investment is IG? Can you just in a few words tell us the status of IG developing in Vietnam? Yeah, well, uh, I, I mentioned one of the big uh, investors in Vietnam was Samsung. Um, uh, Samsung is, is so big, it accounts for about 25% of total Vietnam exports. So if you if you just pause and think about that, it, it controls twenty five percent of the Vietnam economy. So that's that's amazing. Um, and so uh, it, together with Samsung, uh, there are, essentially there are three telco developers: uh, uh, Viettel, uh, VNPT, which is their post office, uh, and and, and Mobifone. Um, uh, by far, probably Viettel is the most uh, significant player if you're looking at five G. Viettel is actually controlled by the army. Um, and, and so uh, they have, you know, a lot of, a lot of funding. Um, uh, and and uh, for example, in the recent trials, uh, which was done in Hanoi, uh, they, they they started with over over hundred over hundred and forty base stations. So that is by far uh, the most uh, significant five uh, G trials. It's not five uh, G obviously is not as developed as in say Singapore, uh, but uh, we are looking in, over the next. Uh, three years uh, for it to be uh, fully implemented. Thank you very much Thanks for this uh, insightful information about, about Vietnam. Thank you, thank you. And, and thank you, Anna. Uh, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, we are still a bit late, uh, but uh, you know that, that's the way it is. Uh, we, we don't have any questions at this point from the audience, but we may have questions in the networking lounges a bit later. So please stick around and, and we'll get there. Uh, we just have, you know, the closing speech, which which will take a few minutes, and and we can uh, join the uh, the networking lounge. Okay. Thank you. 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 Well, uh, what a day! We've had very insightful presentations today uh, by various people, and I would like to say a big thank you to to our panelists. Um, if I were to summarize our discussions, a few topics come to mind. We talked about investment themes, investment structures, and a few key geographies in the region. Among the themes, gaming, metaverse, NFT took center stage. And I must admit that I've learned a lot today, thanks to the very thorough discussion among Lilings and uh, RISWIS panelists. I'm amazed at the investment opportunities that we've heard about, even if you know, some of the risk, obviously, like those outlined by Victor, must be kept in mind. You know, before, before we end, I would like to thank my partner, Eugene, and his guests for informing us on the novel transaction structures that can be considered for technology investments. Uh, it does not mean that we will stop doing, you know, plan vanilla, m &A or VC investments anytime soon, but hearing about the new opportunities created by, you know, Canadian and Singapore SPACs was inspiring. Uh, being able to invest in digital assets was, you know, another eye-opener, and I have no doubt that this could, you know, become mainstream sooner than we expect. Finally, Amanda's panel and the fireside chat, which I just moderated, 
has shown us that cross-border transactions are booming in the region. Chinese investors are interested in Southeast Asia investments. They are interested in Singapore, for sure. They have certain specific expectations and constraints, which investing companies must be aware of. And that was the purpose of, of Amanda's panel, obviously. On my end, I learned quite a lot just now about the tech investment landscape in India, the Philippines, and Vietnam. No doubt that Singapore investors and others will come to seize the many opportunities which were presented to us. As you've probably noticed, uh, the tech investment landscape is in flux. We heard about data privacy, foreign investment regulations, and we clearly don't have answers to all the questions. But, you know, in a sense, this is good news for all the business leaders in the audience. You know, there is much that remains to be done. So I trust you will all go back to your offices this afternoon with new ideas and, and new ambitions. On our side, we will remain as active as ever, helping you to execute on your objectives. And, you know, we will always be by your side to advise on the legal aspects of your projects. Our program today is almost finished. Uh, we would like to keep the conversation going. For that, right now, we've got the networking lounge. So please join us there. If you've got any questions, anything that you'd like to discuss, we'll be happy to be around. Uh, most, if not all, of the panelists will be there. So feel free to, to join us for this, uh, for this informal session. In addition to that, we regularly publish short notes on topics of interest. We organize events such as this one. So don't hesitate to call us. And if there is any project that you would like to discuss, well, obviously, we will always be happy to be a, a sounding board. So I'm going to see you in a few minutes in the networking lounge. And thank you for spending the day with us.